All right, here we begin the videos for chapter 12. And chapter 12 has uh, several different topics, the first of which is intermolecular forces. And intermolecular versus intramolecular um, is kind of an important distinction. So far in this semester, we've been talking about intramolecular forces, all right? And those are the things that are happening inside of a molecule, the bonds between different elements. Um, now, intermolecular forces are the forces that are at play in between the individual molecules, so outside of the molecule, between two um, whole molecules. And the strength or weakness of intermolecular forces directly affects a number of physical properties that we can observe in the macro world. Boiling point, melting point, surface tension, viscosity, vapor pressure um, are just a few. There are a couple others. I think capillary action um, is one of them. But um, depending on how strong or weak the forces are between individual molecules, we can have drastic differences um, between boiling points, melting points, all those sorts of things. Now, there are three main types of uh, intermolecular forces. And there are a few sort of subsets um, in there as well. But the main types of intermolecular forces, the first is called London dispersion. Okay, or simply just dispersion forces. London dispersion is sort of like a proper name. Um, so most of the time, we'll simply just call them dispersion forces. Right, and London dispersion is the weakest of the intermolecular forces. The difference, uh, the but the important thing about that is that London dispersion can be done by everything. Right, so if you're ever asked about a particular molecule and, and what types of forces it's capable of doing, dispersion forces is always one of the answers. And the reason for that is it just takes an electron cloud. Since every molecule has an electron cloud, every molecule is capable of London dispersion forces. Now, we haven't really talked about electron clouds much, but um, the cloud is sort of a more realistic um, representation of how electrons are with um, a molecule. So far, we've been sort of talking about very neat ball and stick models and, and things, but in reality, the electrons around atoms in molecules basically looks like a blob right, full of electrons. Now with mathematical models, we can show that those electrons spend more time around certain areas of the, the molecule than others. Um, but in reality, they're, they're kind of everywhere, right? So if I have one molecule here with its electron cloud and another molecule nearby with its electron cloud, Okay, and those electrons are in constant motion. And what happens is if we have a momentary shift, of electrons, right, let's say for just a moment, most of the electrons in that cloud are on one side of it, because they're in constant motion. And let's say the molecule next to it also has a similar shift. And what we end up with is a negative side, because all the negatives are all the negatively charged electrons are on one side of the cloud, and that creates a positive side as well. And so for just a moment. We have an attraction. Right? So we say that this is a temporary dipole. 
temporary dipole. Right, and dipole meaning two poles. So it's temporarily, and that's the important part, temporarily polar. Another term for that is polarized. Temporarily polarized electron cloud. Right, so, and then in the next instant, those electrons move again and this attraction goes away. Okay, but then it, bond, then it happens with the next molecule over, and then it changes to the next molecule and the next molecule. So it's constantly shifting and moving. But if all of the electron clouds in a given substance are doing this constantly, we have an overall sort of cohesion between groups of molecules. Right, so with this temporary polarization, the more polarizable... the stronger the forces. Right, and so how do we get a more polarizable um, electron cloud? A bigger cloud is more polarizable. Right, if I have more electrons on one side of, of a of an area, that means that I have more negative charge. So a bigger cloud is more polarizable. If it's more polarizable, I have stronger forces. All right, so size is one aspect of dispersion strength. The other is shape, right? So size and shape determine strength of intermolecular forces. So if I have two molecules with the same number and type of atoms, same molar mass, same number of electrons, So this is C5H12. Right? Versus Those are supposed to be H's by the way. among the many reasons that I'm not an organic chemist, because I don't like drawing the letter H. Okay, so this is also C5H12. Right, so they'll have the same number of electrons, the same mass, so which one will have the stronger forces? And the answer is the long flat mono model, molecule. Right, the reason for that is surface area, right? And the, the easiest way to sort of um, visualize this is um, imagine that you have a pair of tennis balls covered in Velcro. Velcro tennis balls. Right, so if we stick those together, that small area is about all that they actually touch. Right, so right there in the middle on the curve of the sphere, that's about where they touch, where they interact. So the tennis ball is kind of like our uh, branched C5H12 here. Right? It's sort of a round-ish uh, type of molecule. Now my flat straight chain C5H12 
is a bit more like thinking about a pair of two by fours. Also covered in Velcro. So if I stick those together, I have all this area in which there's contact, right? So I have much greater surface area of sticking between two things than I do with the tennis balls, right? So the long flat model uh, molecule has greater surface area to stick to another one than the highly branched molecule. Right, so when mass is equal, shape and size make the difference between which will have the stronger forces. Right, so if we compare boiling points, so the boiling point for our branched uh, molecule is around 9.5 degrees C. Right, our boiling point for our long flat molecule is 36.1 degrees C. Okay, so stronger forces gives us a higher boiling point. And if we think about it, the act of boiling is separating liquid molecules and causing them to go into the gas state. So if you're in a liquid state, the stronger you can hold on to the molecule next to you, the more energy it takes to separate that cohesion. Right? So it takes a higher, a larger amount of thermal energy, a higher boiling point, in order to get things to separate into the gas state. Okay, so stronger forces, higher boiling point. Okay, we're going to go ahead and stop this video here, and we'll pick it up on our next video with uh, talking about dipole-dipole forces.